Hello everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're gonna to be looking at a great viewer question about impedance matching networks. And specifically, this is about whether or not you should remove ground below the components in an impedance matching network. Now, we're gonna take a look at an overlay on screen, and we're gonna show an example of this from a dev board that is a very popular dev board for the NRF52. And we're then going to explain when you should and should not do this. So let's get started. So I'm inside of Altium Designer and I've pulled up the NRF52 dev board. Now you may remember this particular board from our NRF52 project, which I've linked in the description. There is an impedance matching network here. And if you're familiar with RF designs, this should be somewhat obvious, but I'll just run through it here to show you where all the different components are. So the RF output starts right here on pin 30. And then we have this first capacitor C3, as well as this inductor L1, and then this other capacitor C13 that make up our impedance matching network for this RF line. Then you can see here it comes over to a connector where we have a branch, and then we have one more capacitor here on the output. If you remember our discussion of this uh, particular project when we did our NRF52 using this monopole antenna, we only needed one of these capacitors. But one thing that we did in this project and that you can somewhat see here in this layout, we actually cleared out the ground below this transmission line and the impedance matching network. Now, if you look here on middle layer two and mid layer three, you can actually see there's a big cutout until eventually you get down to layer four, which has a solid ground plane. Here on the top layer, we of course also have a lot of copper pour everywhere because we're balancing out the copper on layer four. Layer two and layer three also have solid copper because of course we wanna balance that stack up, but they only have the cutout right here below all of these components. This isn't necessarily common, but it's certainly something that you will see in some RF designs. Now let's go over to the whiteboard and explain why exactly someone would do this. So before we get started, let's take a look at this viewer question. Sven Grunwald writes, Hi Zach, and once again, a question from Germany. I recently found two reference designs for the same modem. On one PCB, they opened the ground plane under the matching components, and on the other, they did not. Is there a short explanation why? Or in other words, should the plane be opened underneath the matching network, and why is this done? Is this a common practice? Best regards, Sven. This is a great question, Sven. And I don't wanna tell you that it is necessarily common or uncommon, but I have seen it done as well. And there is some good reasons for it. First, let's take a look inside Altium Designer at the NRF52 reference design, and we'll see an instance where this is done on the antenna section and the components that make up the antenna impedance matching network. In the example in the NRF52 board, we basically have a Pi filter and it's set up like this if we look at a circuit model. We basically have our source, we have our first cap, we'll call it C1, then we have an inductor, I hope you all like my inductor drawing, then we have C2, we'll just call this L. These all reference to the same ground net, and then we of course go out to our antenna over here. When we looked at the example in the PCB uh, layout editor, what we saw is that we had all of this copper pour essentially around all of these components. So all of this copper around these components, as well as below the components, sets the impedance of all of these different transmission line sections. All of the copper that makes up the traces on the PCB, essentially what I'm drawing here in blue, all has some capacitance and inductance associated with it, of course, and all of these different sections have the capacitance and their inductance set by the presence of all of this copper that is around those traces. So if you remember the stack up in that board, we basically had a four layer board with signal on the top layer, and then we had ground directly underneath, then we had another ground and some signal, and then we had one final signal layer that also had a lot of copper pour. So we basically had copper on all four layers, 
including this top signal layer surrounding all of these components. So normally when you have a 50 ohm transmission line, which all of these lines in this impedance matching section were 50 ohms, that means that their self capacitance is about three picofarads per inch. Now that's assuming, of course, the dielectric here is DK of about four. Now, this is a universal result, but this is important because here, this three picofarads per inch essentially forms some parasitic capacitance around these components. So this gets to the heart of why you might remove some of the ground around this impedance matching network. And you can either remove it here in the stack up, and if you carve out some ground clearance in this part of the stack up, you should also do it here. And by doing that, you now have reduced some of that parasitic capacitance that we have here, CP, and then also over here. CP. So by removing some of that copper either underneath or around these components, you're reducing the parasitic capacitance to ground and thereby ensuring that this capacitor value C1 and this capacitor value C2 does not deviate from the rated capacitor value. So what I mean by that is this capacitance here, CP, the parasitic capacitance, causes C1 to actually transform into C1 plus a little bit of parasitic capacitance. Same thing goes for C2. C2 also transforms into C2 plus a little bit of parasitic capacitance. You have added in some capacitance here to these two capacitors by having the presence of ground nearby. Same goes for this inductor. So there is some parasitic inductance formed by the current loop wrapping around L passing through these different ground regions in the PCB. So that modifies the value of L as well. And these modifications may not balance each other. So if you design this for, let's say, 50 ohm matching, and you have too much parasitic capacitance here, you may not actually get 50 ohm matching. This may cause the input impedance looking into this matching network to look different than 50 ohms. That's one of the reasons we might want to remove some of that ground. It's to reduce that parasitic capacitance. And if you actually read the application note for the NRF52 design, they state in the application note that they remove the ground below this section of the PCB in order to reduce that parasitic capacitance. So essentially what they did is instead of having the capacitance defined by this layer and this ground plane on L2, it's now instead defined by this top layer and the ground plane on L4. So both of these layers were removed by then increasing this distance from all of the stuff on this top layer to the ground layer. You've now greatly reduced the parasitic capacitance and you've ensured that these two components are closer to their true values. Instead, the parasitic capacitance is now defined by this distance down to L4. So now this is your capacitance. And because you have a greater distance between the top layer and then this bottom layer where you have your ground reference, now you've greatly reduced the parasitic capacitance. That ensures that C1 and C2 are closer to their true values. So I bring this all up because of course I'm looking at a design that I have available and we can then see from the documentation on that design why they removed some of the ground around the impedance matching network. So next, I wanna get into when you should remove some of the ground around the impedance matching network. Now, I don't wanna necessarily say why it's done in every case, but the reduction in parasitic capacitance is a big reason, and then we can see why by actually looking at the values of C1 and C2 in our Pi network. So let's take another look at this circuit. All right, we have our source, we come out and go to C1. We have our inductor here. And then coming off our inductor, we then have our second capacitor. And then this all wraps around to ground. So here we have C1 and C2. Now, if we're talking about the parasitic capacitance specifically, we can determine whether or not we should remove the ground around C1 and C2 by comparing the expected parasitic capacitance with the actual values here of these components used in these circuits. So if you remember from the previous result, if our substrate is DK 
about four, then our parasitic capacitance, which is essentially just the self capacitance of the line as the signal travels down this transmission line, is about three picofarads per inch. During any given cycle of that signal as it travels down the line, we would expect probably no more than three picofarads uh, of parasitic capacitance to be encountered by the signal as it enters this impedance matching network. Now, if you look at the component values that are used in that impedance matching network, you will note that these component values were on the order of picofarads. So I think this one was about one picofarad, and then I think this one was about 1.2 picofarads. This should illustrate why we want to remove some of that parasitic capacitance, because that parasitic capacitance is going to add in parallel to these two capacitors. And what that's going to do is it is then going to affect the impedance matching that this network can provide. Now, I'd like to hit you with a hypothetical. Let's suppose that instead of one picofarad here, we had one nanofarad here, and we had one nanofarad over here. Well, is a three picofarad per inch parasitic capacitance going to affect this capacitance here that we have for this capacitor and this capacitor? Well, the answer is no, because this is now about a 0.3% deviation from the actual capacitance of this capacitor. So because this parasitic capacitance is so small compared to the values of these capacitors, in this case, I would argue you can probably leave the ground alone and not have to clear it out below these components. Now, you can estimate about how much parasitic capacitance might be encountered by an RF signal as it travels down this line just by looking at the wavelength of the signal lambda. So for a microstrip line, which is what we dealt with in the NRF52 design, the wavelength of the signal is about 29 millimeters, just a little bit longer than one inch. So that means as this wave encounters this branch and then prepares to travel through the inductor and the capacitor, it's going to encounter about three picofarads, because this is just a little longer than an inch. This is three picofarads per inch. You multiply these together. On the order of magnitude, you might expect it to encounter up to about three picofarads. So that's one of the reasons we want to remove that ground. It's going to reduce this value, and it will minimize the impact of that parasitic capacitance on these capacitors. The other option here, of course, is to design your impedance matching network with larger capacitors. Of course, that might affect your bandwidth and your center frequency. So there are a number of factors that you have to keep in mind when selecting these capacitors for use in an RF impedance matching network. Now, you may remember from our ground below inductors video that this was the same justification we used to justify including ground below the inductor in a switching regulator. So what we did is we compared the capacitance to ground to the capacitance across a low side MOSFET in order to determine whether or not the presence of all that ground was going to have a noticeable effect on the power conversion efficiency. What we found was that for off the shelf MOSFETs, we wouldn't see a big effect. So I encourage you to take a look at the link in the description and go watch that video to learn more. Thanks for watching everybody. Once again, make sure to check out those links in the description, including the other video about ground below inductors, and you can learn a lot more about when you should remove ground below your impedance matching networks. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section. And of course, don't forget to call your fabricator folks. Yeah. <laughs>